One, say I want to thank you for this opportunity uh, to stand up here before you this morning, but I, I tell you what, since Brother Rogers sick this morning, I really, I, he'd rather be up here than any other place. You don't remember Brother Roger this morning, but I'll just be truthful with you. I'm glad to be here this morning. You know, of all the places that there are in the world, there's no place like my whole church this morning. And you know what? It just thrills me inside to say my whole church. Several comments have already been made this morning about how everyone here this morning seems like one large family. You know what? what Deborah and I, we haven't been going here all that long, but you know what? It seems like I've known you all my life. And that's really wonderful, but uh, I, I don't want to keep your time or anything, but if you will, we turn your Bible to the Book of Psalms, chapter 107. We'll read uh, several verses this morning, not a lengthy uh, number of verses this morning, but we just want to deliver what the Lord has laid on our heart. Uh, we got home last night at around 8 o'clock from Birmingham, and we saw where Brother Roger Hall. He asked us if we'd uh, get ready to preach this morning. But in verse number 23, and y'all pray praying for us this morning, my voice is, <clears throat> this morning when I got up, my throat and everything felt fine. But the longer I was up, the, the, the more it's giving me problems. So pray for us this morning. Verse number 23 says, They that go down to the sea and ship, that do business in great waters, these see the works of the Lord and his wonders in the deep. For he commandeth and raiseth the stormy wind, and lifteth up the waves thereof. They mount up to the heaven, they go down again to the depths. Their soul is melted because of trouble. They reel to and fro, and stagger like a drunken man, and are at their wit's end. Then they cry unto the Lord in their trouble, and he bringeth them out of their distresses. <clears throat> he maketh the, calm, the storm of calm, so that the waves thereof are still. Then are they glad because they be quiet, so he bringeth them into their desired haven. Lord, we ask you this morning that you would bless this morning. We pray that you would bless the reading of your word. God, we pray this morning you would bless this congregation. And Lord, we ask you that if there's one in our midst, that doesn't know you in the free part of the sin, Lord. We pray the day would be the day that their name will be written in the Lamb Book of Life. Lord, I ask you this morning that you touch us now. Be with Brother Roger and Sister Betty there. And Lord, we ask you that you lay your hand upon him and, and touch his body and take away that illness that he had, God, because I know he'd rather be here than any place else. But Lord, I ask you now to be with us this morning for us in your name we pray. Amen. You may be seated this morning. I want to take just a little while. And as we read the scripture here, now every one of you can understand by the reading of the scripture here that this is talking about those that fell on the ocean. Uh, if you, you watch any of the reality shows, and especially if you want, and I really like to watch the one called The Deadliest Catch, where the guys are catching the snow crowds and the king crowd. Uh, they're off the coast of Alaska there, and I see the hardship that they go through uh, in order to do their job. And so they can understand uh, what this scripture is talking about this morning. But I want to ask you today, uh, what are you doing to reach your desired haven this morning? Just as it said in verse 30, it says, So he brings them into their desired haven this morning. I want to ask you, what are you doing in order to get to your desired haven this morning. I want to uh, tell you about five things that if you want to reach uh, your desired haven this morning, there are five things that I think that a person needs in their life in order for them to reach their destination. Now, I'm not talking about getting out of here on Lake Gunnersville and going out there on a little bitty boat. I'm talking about getting out in the ocean over Do you 
saved right now. I feel a little bit better today than I did the first time I stood up here and preached. I got to know everybody a little bit better. I got to understand everybody a little bit better. And so I, I tell you right now, I'm a little bit freer today. But I want to ask you, friend, what have you got with you and while you sail on your way to heaven? I don't know how many people have been in here that's ever been in the military. I don't know how many people in here have ever had a management job at a big corporation. But I'll let me say this, it doesn't matter what military unit it is. It doesn't matter what big corporation it is. It doesn't matter what small organization that it is. Uh, you cannot have a good success uh, with your organization unless you have the right leadership. And I will say this, no military unit can ever be successful. No organization can be successful without the proper leadership. And let me ask you, do you have the right captain at your helm this morning? I was thinking this morning as we come to church, and, uh, I was thinking about the song, We're Sailing Down the Stream of Life. You know, it, it's talking about our lives, how we're sailing in this life. And I want to ask you, are you going to be sailing around? You know, I had a man this many years ago. He came up and he had one of these car tags. He wanted to give me one and they said on the front of it, Jesus is my co-pilot. I looked at him and I said, no, sir, I don't want it. He said, why not? I said, because Jesus is not my co-pilot. Jesus is my pilot this morning. He's not my co-pilot. He is the one that's fully in charge. He's the one that, he is the one that I want you to know this morning that I've got a captain that's in charge of my vessel today. And I want to ask you, do you have a captain in charge of your vessel today? I want to tell you something now. In God's army, there are no generals, there are no colonels, and there are no majors. The highest rank in God's army today is a captain. You turn over to Hebrews chapter, I believe it's chapter number 2, verse number 10. And I'm going to try, now I've got all of these written down, but I'm going to try to do every one of them from memory this morning. In chapter 2, verse number 10, it says, For it became him uh, for whom were all things, and by whom were all things, and bringing many sons unto uh, captivity, and making the captain of their salvation perfect through suffering. I want to ask you something. Do you have that captain this morning that was made perfect through suffering? You remember Jesus, and we just heard him sing about it uh, uh, this morning. Oh, he could have called 10,000 angels, uh, but he endured the cross. He endured the shame. He endured the pain on the cross for every person in this building today. And that verse that said in making the captain of our salvation perfect through suffering. Brother Larry, how do you know that's the captain that he's talking about? You go over to Joshua chapter 5 and you look at verse number 13, 14, and 15. It said that they, the children of Israel, was iron that was getting ready to go into uh, uh, Jericho and take the city of Jericho. And it said Joshua was out walking around and said he was standing before Jericho and he said he saw a man. He said he saw this man standing there and said he had his sword drawn. Hold it out. Joshua walked up to him and said, Sir, you be for us or you be for our adversary. This man answered Joshua and said, Nay, but as captain of the Lord's host. I don't care what you think this morning, but that was a free incarnate a uh, visitation of Christ on this earth. Why? He said, because I am captain of the Lord's host this morning. And what else did he say? He said that Joshua bowed down on his knees in front of him and said, what do I need to do? And the, they said, this angel of the Lord said, remove your shoes from off your feet from the crown that you stand on is holy ground. I want to tell you something. You can read in the book of Revelation where John went down and bowed before the angel. And the angel said, don't do it. But this angel did not tell him not to worship him. He wanted him to worship. Because why? He was captain. He's the number one man. 
He's the number one man of God's army. That was Jesus Christ. I want to know, is Jesus the captain of your life today? I hear so many people say, oh, I'm, I'm letting Jesus be the, the leader of my life. But yet, whenever you see them, they'll make this statement, I'm going to do it my way. I'm going to do it my way. I want to tell you something, people. I've done it my way before, and I got tired of fixing the mess that I make when I get done. I want Jesus to be the one that's in charge of me. What about you this morning? Jesus, your captain? I spent several years in the Marine Corps. I'll just tell you like this right here. I got tired of my mom and daddy telling me what to do. I got tired of my daddy saying, son, I want you to get out and get you a job and start paying for some of the things around here. My mom would come and say, son, I want you to start cleaning your room. I got to see you tired of my mom and daddy telling me what to do. I said, I'll fix them up. I'll go join the ring for <laughs> Showed you how stupid I was. One of the first things I had to do, I had to clean my room up. What was the next thing I had to do? I had to pay for what I got. I'd been better off staying at home. At least then I could have walked to the refrigerator whenever I wanted to and opened it up, got me something to eat whenever I wanted it. And I couldn't then. I couldn't then. I had a little bitty short red headed drill sergeant, or not, not drill sergeant, drill instructor. He came up to about approximately right along in there. Me, he had freckles on him about that big around. His hair was just as blood red as this young man's shirt. I want to tell you right now, the devil took lessons from him on me. But you know what? I want to make sure that I got the right captain. But I want to tell you something. This drill instructor taught me how to build a ring. Jesus is teaching us how to be a child of God. Now I'm going to tell you something. I'm the son of Bobby Joe and Magdalene, Virginia Magdalene Cook. And I love both of them. I've been their son for 57 years. They've been my mom and dad for 57 years. But I want to tell you something. I'm so glad this morning that Jesus one night on a Thursday night in my grandpa's dining room that he came to me and said, I want you to be a part of my family. And I got saved that night. Jesus became my captain. But you know what? As I grew and as I learned, I want Jesus to be my captain more and more every day that I live. You said, Brother Larry, don't you? Have you got old enough now that you've learned some things? I said, yeah, I, I've learned enough to know that you're better off letting Jesus take charge. Amen. But I can tell you right now, I'll still make a mess. Not only do you need a captain, I believe that the number one has a sailing vessel. And if you've ever been on a large ship, you'll know exactly where I'm coming from. A large ship has got to have a captain. And there's something else. It doesn't matter how big technology gets on these big ships. It doesn't matter how many computer screens they have on them. You're always going to have a map on that vessel. And for you to have a successful journey, not only must you have a captain, but you've got to have a map that you can go by. Well, why don't they have a map? Brother Larry, we got GPS now. Well, you still got a map, have a map to see where you're at. Uh, the majority of us in here probably got phones that's got GPS on you bring Bring it up say, okay, I want to know my location in just a couple of minutes. You'll come up and say, right here you are. And why does it show? It shows the map. See, you can't find out where you're at unless you see the things around you. And without a map, we cannot sail this life successfully. And what are you talking about, preacher? I'm talking about the Word of God. Psalms chapter 119, verse number 9. It says, Wherewithal shall a young man cleanse his way? 
By taking heed thereunto according to what? Thy word. Now, Brother Larry, how do I know what I need to do? <laughs> now, I'm an engineer by trade. I design machinery. But I go a little bit further than that. I write the manual that when we sell that piece of machinery, that when whoever buys it, they can open that manual up, and that manual is supposed to tell them everything about that machine they need to know. Well, I want to tell you something. This book right here will tell you everything you need to know in order to live a successful Christian life. Amen. I'll even go one step further. It's the only book we can use to get us through this life. You remember when Jesus was talking to his disciples? And I believe Brother Roger preached on it not too long ago. They were said a lot of them went away. And he asked the ones that were standing, he says, will you go away also? And Peter said, to whom shall we go? And what did he say? He said, thou hast the word. of truth, of salvation. You have what we need. Psalms 119, verse 133. The psalmist right? Order my steps according to thy word. Now, Brother Larry, I'll just be true to we. I know growing up, growing up, that I wasn't supposed to lie. My mom would tell me, said, son, don't ever lie to me. I did one time, see what she'd do. Well, when she got through with me, and after she wore out three or four hickory limbs on me, I realized I'm not supposed to lie. But, you know what? It goes a little bit further than that. The Bible teaches us not to lie. Now, mom and daddy can tell you kids all day long, don't lie, don't lie. But listen, the scripture will teach you, it will teach you how to lie, it'll teach you the truth. And it'll tell you, don't lie, but know the truth. And the truth is Jesus Christ and Him crucified and resurrected from the grave. That's the truth. But without the Word of God, there is no way I can go from point A to point B. Well, Brother Larry, the, the Lord will give you everything you need, yeah? But I tried to tell people down through the years, they say, Brother Larry, I have had such a problem in my Christian walk. And let me say this, and I, and I don't say this to put anybody down or anything like that, but I got to know some people that will go to church without their Bible. Let's get you a good King James Bible and carry it with you all the time. I've got the King James Bible on my phone. I've got it on my computer at home. I've got it on my computer at work. I've got it on my tablet that I use. I've got it on everything. I've even got it on CDs in my truck. Why? I want to know what the Word of God tells me that I need to know this morning. A lot of people, I've got a hand. I, I belong to a wood club, a woodworker club. <laughs> and they sent me a hand a few years back. It has on the front of it, no instructions necessary, just five trips to the hardware store. Well, a lot of people look at it. I don't need the instructions. All I know is what department to go to the hardware store. No, we need to know the instructions on how this thing works. And without it, we will not be successful. Had a customer call me up a few months ago. We started producing a new machine, put it out on the market. And if you don't know what you're doing, you could end up killing yourself or very much badly maiming yourself on this machine without knowing how to run it. We called me up and said, Larry, my name is so and so. I'm with the Viking Fire Protection Group, and I'm the safety manager of our uh, organization. We just had a mishap on one of your machines, and we want to know. Uh, if there was any way we could have prevented it. I said, what happened? He said, well, 
The guy, when he put a piece of pipe in it and turned it on, it cut his finger off. And I said, they didn't use the, uh, I said, we manufacture a tool that we put with every machine that he uses that to attach to that pipe and that keeps his hand away from that big hydraulic pipe clamp. And I know some of you may not, but just follow along with me. And I said, it keeps his hand away from that big hydraulic pipe clamp. There was a long silence, and he said, what? He said, you mean this could have been prevented? I said, yes, it could have. If you would have read the book. What do you mean read the book? I said, it shows you in the manual that we sent with every machine how to run it. And that is covered in section number 8, page 27 of the manual. Guess what happened over the next three months? We sent out about 45 new manuals and 45 sets. Come to find out that this company, they had about 50 places across America that bought this machine from us. And whenever one of them got it, they opened up a box. Well, I wonder what that is. Well, I don't know. We don't need it. Make sure it's garbage. Don't throw God's word in the garbage. It's there for a reason. We ended up selling. Now let me tell you this. When we put one of these special tools in a machine, it doesn't cost them a dime. But when they call us up and tell us that they want one, it'll cost them $1,900. We sold 45 at $1,900 a piece that this company had to pay because they threw it away. I wonder how you feel. I wonder how many young men, young ladies that's in a prison today because somebody gave them a track or somebody gave them a little New Testament and they took it and threw it away. I'll not go by what that book says. I'll not go by what's written in there. I don't need to. That was written by man and it's no good. I'll testify to you today, friend, that this book was not written by man alone. It was written by holy men as they were moved by the Spirit of God Amen. and directed by the Spirit of God. We've got to have a captain. We've got to have the Word of God as a man. What have we got to have next? We've got to have the Spirit as a compass. Wait a minute, Brother Larry. Wait a minute. The Spirit as a compass. You turn over to the 16th chapter of the book of St. John, you look at verse number 13. I'll give you just a second to turn there. Let me turn my notes here before I know exactly where I'm at. <laughs> verse number 13 says, How be it, when he, the Spirit of truth, is come, he will guide you into all truth. For he shall not speak of himself. But whatsoever he shall hear, that shall he speak. And he will show you things to come. Now I bought my wife a compass a few years ago. And she kept asking me, honey, which way is north? Which way is south? So I bought her a compass. You know what I put? It up in the drawer. Uh, and you tell him, why? She didn't want to use it. That compass is a very special instrument. Why? Because it only works by an outside source directly. What does this verse say? It said, He shall not speak of himself, but whatsoever he shall hear, that shall he speak. Pull that compass out, it doesn't matter which way you, 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 you stand or which way you turn. The black side of that needle is always one point north. It don't matter what you do. You can turn this way, you can turn that way. That needle is one point north. And friend, without the correct compass in your spiritual life, you will not find your way properly with God's word as your man. 
they go hand in hand. In the military, they taught us to use a compass. But you cannot use a compass unless you have a map. They go like Why do they go hand in hand? That compass will show you the correct way to go. The Holy Spirit will not speak of himself, but he will point you to who? He'll point you to the Savior. You can take the Holy Spirit over here. Which way is he point? To the Savior. You take the Holy Spirit over here. Which way is he point? Point to the Savior. That compass will only point in one direction. The Holy Spirit will only point in one direction. Brother Larry, I don't have any experience in using a compass. You don't need experience in using a compass. All you got to do is look at which way it's pointing and go in the direction it's pointing. I just don't believe that, Brother Larry. I was a scoutmaster for Boy Scout Troop, or assistant scoutmaster for Boy Scout Troop at Annie and I got to go on. They have competition. Well, they had a course set up. You had to take the compass and you had to take off and step so many paces and then turn this way. And I worked with our boys and I tied the tire rope around their feet where they could take an exact step in measurement. And we done that for several months or several weeks until they got to where they took the same length and when their boys went through that course. And when they got to the end, the instructor came up and they said, boys, we want to know what y'all been doing. They said, we've been practicing. Now, the boy, our boy that we had done our part, he had to go 150 paces in this direction. Then go 200 paces in this direction. Then 150 paces in this direction. And what it was is it was supposed to bring you back exactly to where you started. If you thought it correct. Our boy was that far off, a half a pace off. He said, I want to know how you've done that. He said, we practiced. We practiced. Friend, you want to be success. You practice with the Spirit. You practice with the Word. The Bible teaches us in Timothy, 1 Timothy chapter 2, verse number 15. It says, study to show thyself approved unto God. A work on that leadeth not to be ashamed. Rightly dividing the word of truth. Friend, we need to know the word of God today as a map. We know that we need to know oh, what the high guard that's around us. We need to know when we're coming up to a cliff. We need to know what the devil is throwing at us out there. Without a compass and without the word of God showing us, we're not going to land. Now, those of us that grew up here on Sand Mountain, we know you can take off walking in any direction. You're going to come up on a creek. You're going to come up on, upon a cliff. It may be 10, 15, 20 feet high. There's some around here that's 100 and something feet high. If you don't know where you're at, you get lost in this area without the proper word of God. And let me say this, without the proper word of God. Yes, I said the proper word of God. There's some out there people that tell you,
You could have called him the Christ. Christ just means anointed. What I'm getting at is that they got away. We're calling Christ the Son of the Living God. Why in the world doesn't believe he's the Son of God? The majority of people don't believe he's the Son of God. I'm going to tell you something, Brother Larry. He is the Son of God this morning. He is the only begotten Son of God this morning. And thank God I'm the adopted Son of God today. Amen. Where are you standing? Now I've got to go on. I'm about done. I'm, 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 I'm time to. Okay, we've got to have a captain. We've got to have a map. We've got to have a compass. What's the next thing? We've got to have faith in Years ago, I took my family up to Washington, D.C., and we went up through Norfolk, Virginia. There by the big naval station there in Norfolk, Virginia. You can see those big aircraft carriers sitting out there at the, at the, har at the harbor or at the dock. You can see that big chain. I, I got a piece of, uh, 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 of one of the chains that they used on one of them ships. I got it, I, I got it on one of my plows at home to, to weigh it down for it. Cut down in the dirt real good. And the length's only are just a few longer, but it's not the main one. You can see the chain on that ship and the links. A few longer. But you know what? They don't use that chain to tie that ship up when it's at dock. No, they use a rope. When that big aircraft carrier is at dock, they use a rope to tie it to the dock. They don't use the chain. They use the rope. Why? And if the tide goes in and out, that ship moves up and down. If it was tied with a chain and that tide started going out, that ship would literally rip. What it was tied to would literally rip it out of the ground. So they use a rope so when the tide goes down, why that rope will stretch. Still holds, but it will stretch. It will give. We need faith. As a rope, you say, now, Brother Larry, you say that our faith is going to stretch. It's going to be stretched to the point sometimes that you're going to think it's going to break. The Bible says in Hebrews chapter 11, verse number 1. Faith is the substance of things hoped for. The evidence of things not seen. How is faith a rope? Well, it's just like the other thing you got to have as a Christian. you got to have a good anchor. Faith and rope go hand in hand. The Bible tells us, and this is my favorite verse in the Bible, Hebrews 6, 19. Which hope we have as an anchor of the soul, both sure and steadfast, and which reach within that of the faith. How do you know your anchor is gripping on the right thing? By the pull of the rope. Now, I don't know anybody here that's got a basketball or anything, but I'm sure that if you do, you probably went down to Lake Gunner when you pulled up and said, Hey, I've got a pretty good spot. You took through a breaker finger off where you wouldn't drift off this spot. That anchor keeps you in one location. And I'm going to tell you something. We have hope as an anchor. Because that anchor is in Jesus Christ. And you remember what it says there in Hebrews 6, 19? It says, reaches within that of the veil. What is in the veil? Jesus Christ is in the veil. It's Jesus this morning. Brother, I want to tell you, I'm so glad today. Holy Spirit came to me and said, Larry, let me point you to the Savior. He said, now Larry, I'm going to give you a rope. I want you to tie it on to that anchor that I'm going to give you. And I want you to look at Jesus. And I want you to throw it. And I want you to get that anchor and dig down in Jesus. So it's going to be the only thing that's going to haunt you in this life. It's going to be the only thing that when the storms of life come and they begin to beat against you and they begin to try to pull you away, that anger and that faith is going to keep you with Jesus. 
I don't believe there's anything such thing as atheists. I think that, and I believe this, that there's something deep down inside of every man, woman, boy, and girl that lets them know that there's something more to life than what's on the outside. You know, they, you, everybody remembers just a couple of weeks ago this Robin Williams been suicide. They've already went and got the best psychologist that they can find in America to say, why did they do this? I'll tell you exactly why right now. There was something inside of him telling Robin there's something more than riches. There's something more than fame. There's something more than this. There's something more than that. There's something more than this. And that is Jesus this morning. Believe that with all my heart. And I believe many of men, many of women, have went out of this life. Took their own life because they say, I can't find what makes me happy. What it is, they just don't want to admit what it is. Jesus says, I want you to take that faith. The Bible says in Hebrews 11, I think it's verse number 6. It says, without faith it is impossible to please him. For he that come to him must believe that he is. And that he is a rewarder of them that diligently seek him. Now who's it talking about there? If you read the verse before it, it talks about Enoch. And it said, Enoch, please God. That's who he's talking about. You can't please God without faith. Without faith, you can't please God. Let me tell you this right here. Without hope. Without hope. Or without that anchor. Faith is meaningless. Faith is meaningless. Why you got to have something solid that is going into it. Hebrews chapter 12, verse number 2. It says, looking unto Jesus, and I gotta hurt. Looking unto Jesus, the author and finisher, and finisher of our faith. I've had people come up and say, well, I want my faith to be strong. I want my faith to be Jesus Christ. I don't want about you. I want my faith to be Jesus Christ. You can't get any stronger than that. So he's the author and the finisher of our faith. I like to read out all of my heart. I've got several. I've got the one written by Norman Schwarzkopf. It doesn't take a hero. I've got the one that was written by uh, Colonel Oliver North. I like to read them that where they wrote them their self about their life. The one I like most of all is one written by Robert Lee Scott. He was the first executive officer of the Flying Tiger Squadron in World War II. He's also the oldest man or the oldest officer to fly an F-16 F fighter jet. He flew it at age 76. He retired, I believe he was a brigadier general when he retired. He always flew planes all his life. He retired just outside, just off of an Air Force base and said he'd sit there and he'd watch a jet fly over. He went and he said, I want to learn to fly. I want to fly with them. They told him, they said, you can't. You're too old. You can't pass the physical. He said, put me through the physical, and I bet y'all pass it. Pass the physical. They didn't fly the plane. He flew it for a while, and he came back and said, boy, that's all I ever want to do. What makes that book so interesting, Larry? Put on the inside of the front page. Got rid of my friend Larry Gunner. On the inside of every God's word, he's written in there to my friend. Please read it. Please enjoy it. 
Valeu.